Great. So a very warm welcome. We're now recording and beginning this uh, end of rain celebration, which is uh, a traditional way to celebrate the end of uh, the monastic rains retreat, which goes for three months um, during the Southeast Asia monsoon period. And so I've just been in retreat for three months, more or less. Arjun Brown's been in retreat, but also supporting his monastery, of course. And uh, yeah, we're really happy to have a full house of people for today so that we can share some Dhamma, some meditation, some uh, discussion as well, and some blessings, some meta blessings, and uh, hopefully also have time for you to connect with each other and put you into small little discussion groups for like 10 minutes at some point. Uh, so we are live streaming. I want to say hello to everybody on Facebook, especially those who haven't um, seen us for a long time, because the Veins Retreat is the time that we focus on our inner work, on our inner practice, and so we're not so much in the public eye. So I'm very delighted that Ajahn Ram could be here today, and many of you will know him, of course, everyone will know him as a great meditation master and also a um, wonderful teacher globally renowned teacher now who you know whose talks are listened to by millions of people but he's also um the chair and the spiritual advisor on our project here in england the anukampa bikuni project which aims to establish the first monastery in the country for women who wish to take full ordination so far there hasn't been such an opportunity for women here and as such i'm actually the first person the first um english non Bikuni to have taken that full ordination. There are a couple of other um, Bikunis in America, one from Wales who took it first. So I'm the second British Bikuni. That's Venerable Ananda Bodhi and a couple of other British nuns here and there, but not in England. So, um, so Ajahn Brown's very much behind that and we're working towards our goals. So this is all part of it. And any donations from today will be going in uh, to promote this to, towards our final monastery that we hope to establish soon. So I want to welcome Ajahn Ram, and he told me I don't need to say much more about him. So uh, Ajahn will give a Dhamma talk for the first yeah. 40 minutes or half an hour, perhaps, and then some yeah. guided meditation, and we'll take Ex it from there. Excellent. So welcome everybody to this uh, celebration the celebration of the end of the range retreat. Uh, every monastery has one month to do this, uh, from the full moon day, which ends the retreat, and uh, for another four weeks afterwards. So, uh, Bodhi Nyana Monastery, we did our Katina ceremony. Uh, that was last Sunday. Uh, 1,500 people there, which is a huge amount of people. And uh, for today, I haven't checked it, because I'll be teaching all over the place. Uh, Dhammasara had their retreat to their, so their um, uh, continuous ceremony. I don't know how that went today because I haven't checked in with them yet. But anyway, it's a pleasure to be able to help out. And the reason I say it's a pleasure was one of the events which happened during the rains retreat was uh, I visited Dhammasara uh, Monastery. That's our Bikuni Monastery here in Perth. And something occurred which may be quite emotional. And that was when um, the Sangha of Bhikkhunis at Dhammasara uh, did the first uh, ordination of Bhikkhunis uh, in house. Usually, we need to get a preceptor in to actually a senior Bhikkhuni to do the ceremony. This time, uh, the senior nun there, Venu Hasapanya, is now completed the 12 years uh, required by the Vinaya uh, to be the, uh, the preceptor. And I never really thought much of that at the time. But when I was there, you know, in the ceremony, and I saw that how this community had developed over 12 years, and you now how, what it was meaning to the people who are local here, but also to people overseas as well. I thought, wow, this is something really, really amazing. We're actually doing something, something wonderful. 
And guys, we can't really know just what it feels like for females who have been put on the outside for such a long time and given lots of difficulties. And now we're starting, starting to have monasteries where females are seen to be treated with equity. I know we always say, oh, we treat people with equality, but actually seeing that, actually putting our, our words, our thoughts into reality is something which is amazing. So it was almost like that that monastery, Bikuni Monastery in Perth, Western Australia, is like complete. It's on its own, it's, it's developed, it's stable, it's gonna last a long, long, long time. But of course, then I look at Venerable Chandra over there. She's beaming with smiles sometimes. But sometimes. It's really very, yeah, <laughs> but it's very, very difficult for her. There's one Bikuni alone, sort of over in UK without you know, a home. We say that, no, Bikuni should be homeless, but, <laughs> no, but there's something else required there, a place where you can look up to, a place where I can go and just also participate in some of these great ceremonies to know that all of your sacrifices, my sacrifices have meant something. We have something to show for it, something that's gonna last for hundreds of years. It is embarrassing, basically. I keep on saying this. It's embarrassing that we're supposed to be a spiritual tradition. A spiritual tradition, it runs on ethics. It runs on things like treating people fairly. It runs on leading our world, not in politics, but you know, in truth of the heart. And it's just untenable that for such a long time we've treated women like this. And it's not just that, it's just today when I have given two talks today down the south of Western Australia. So I'm a little bit tired, I must admit, but I want to give this talk because usually when I get tired, I give the best talks. That's why many of my monks tell me, get more tired at your go and do this, go and do that, because you give a much better talk afterwards. But somehow or other, any sort of restrictions, limitations in my brain, I'm too tired to enforce them, so I just speak and it flows and sometimes it moves me and moves others. And it's also at the same time this evening, there's one of my other disciples, I'm very happy to have ordained him. And you know, he was a, a prominent gay person before. And he taught me a lot about the LGBTQIA plus community. And he is also very proud of him. Tonight is Halloween's night. <laughs> and so he's running a lot, a lot of, of scary Buddhist stories about Halloween. In other words, but putting some morality into it and putting some uh, truth inside of those stories of Halloween. And so here comes one of those stories. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's going to come. This was the story of a, a friend of mine who bought a, a townhouse in London. And when he bought the townhouse in London, he bought it very cheap, simply because it was haunted. And the real estate agent said to him, it's a haunted house. No one wants it. Do you want to buy it? He said, yes, because I don't believe in ghosts. So he bought it anyway. And the, first, <laughs> the first night in that haunted house, he was sleeping in a camp bed. There was no furniture in there yet on the ground floor. And in the middle of the night, just before midnight, he was woken up by a sound. Rap, 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 rap. And he sort of wondered what the heck was that? He got out of bed, checked everywhere. All the windows were shut, the doors were shut. There was no wind coming in the house. There was no mice or anything to cause that sound. So he thought just imagination. So he went, up, he went back to bed. But before he got into bed, he heard it again. Rap, 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 from upstairs. So he climbed the stairs. And even though he didn't believe in ghosts, so he thought, he still was very, very wobbly on his legs. When he got to the uh, upstairs, he turned on the lights. He looked around, saw nothing, no, 
reasonable cause for that sound to be made. So he gave it up as just imagination. And as he was going down the stairs, he heard it again, even louder. Rap, 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 rap. He was coming from the top story. So he went to the top story, turned on the lights, looked all around, could see nothing. No scientific reason why that should no that noise could happen. And being confused but relieved, he couldn't see any ghosts in the house. He was about to go down and go to sleep again when he heard it the loudest yet. And this was from the attic. Attics are very, very scary places. Sometimes they put crazy people up there. Sometimes there's all sorts of strange things happen in attics. We had to find out what had caused the noise. Was it really something supernatural, especially on the 31st of October? So he went through the manhole into the attic with a flashlight, there was no lights up there. And he saw so much rubbish in that attic and he couldn't see any ghosts, but then, then he heard the sound right behind him. Rap, 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 rap. And he turned around and he saw it. He saw it clearly in the beam of his flashlight. It was an old piece of Christmas wrapping paper. Rap, rap. <laughs> <laughs> it goes rap, rap, okay, wrapping paper. Okay, it is. It is Halloween today as well. And Buddhism, in monastic Buddhism, we must somehow relate to the cultures in which we're embedded. <laughs> so anyway, you can tell that story to anybody at Oxford or Daughter Night if you're living in UK. But more than that, that uh, when we see that uh, we do have equity even for, for all people in this world. Why not? May all people be happy and well. We chant that day in, day out. And all people does mean all people. And so the part of my job, the part of my commitment is to make sure that Anakampa Bhikkhuni project comes to fruition. It's one of those jobs I have to do. And I'll make it happen. And this is one of the reasons we have katinas, you know, to celebrate our support for those monastics who have let go enough to sacrifice what they want to do for the sake of others. And, and it's not easy being a monk. It's really harder even being a bhikkhuni without that support. And instead of getting depressed about things which aren't perfect, we want to understand them and work how to make them perfect, to make them as good as we possibly can. And that's one takes a lot of hard work. But as I said, seeing one nun's monastery, Bikuni Monastery, which I supported in the UK, just knows the joy and the happiness which comes when you see it come to some sort of fruition, to see the retreat centers which we have built here, to see the other monasteries which we're building to see just the effect of some of those uh, talks and teachings and how we can connect with people. In this particular time, people say they're always depressed after COVID, that there's more negativity in our world, that the mental health problems are increasing. And you know, that's a truth all over the world. And how can we try and do something to solve that problem? And sometimes that's your friends, associates, your family members. You know, they get depressed, suicidal. Sometimes they get admitted to hospitals. Can't we help? And sometimes you think that our oh, Ajahn Brahm is just blowing his own trumpet, as they said, just trying to promote his own causes. But it's not for me. So I've seen over many, many years of practice, especially through meditation, especially that 
Uh, please don't interrupt, Venerable Chanda. I was looking at your face for 20 minutes just before I came on air, and I was very tired. I saw all the smiling and the joy and the laughter. That is very, very impressive. That is something which you don't see very much with people in our world. We don't see people smiling and laughing and jolly. That cheers us up. And that's one of the reasons why that so many people are trying to join in tonight. It's not so much from what you say as who you are. It's not just the wisdom which people can write books with, but the smile and the joy which connects you with other people. And it's that uh, time you're willing to spend, which I often, uh, I do criticize people sometimes, and I criticize Venerable Chandler for working too hard, helping too many other people, giving more resources than she really has. But that's what I do as well. <laughs> She's a good disciple. <laughs> And that's what I want you to do as well, to support this project. You know, sometimes when people get depressed and they come and say, no, please, I jump Brown, help, what can I do? And sometimes we tell people, oh, just go see a doctor or do some more meditation. There's something else apart from just meditation or taking drugs, you know, uh, prescribed by your doctors. There's something else which is very powerful. And that is inspiration. You get inspired by examples. You get inspired by seeing people who go through a lot of difficulties and get through that and find ways and means which other people just don't know. And you find that when such people do such things, they should get online, they should do a TED talk, they should do something because it encourages others. And one of the things which I've found work enormously is what we call service, having a community. That's what Anukampa Bikuni community is all about. Having a community which supports one another. And you have like little goals. Little goals, like, you know, I've said this so many times for Paul, then all Chanda, to actually to have a place, a place where she can stay. A little home where you can visit without sort of making more work for her. And when I, that happens, then I'll get emotional again. <laughs> I will see that I feel guilty, honestly. I feel guilty. I haven't managed that to get that yet. It's mostly because of COVID. But when we do get such stuff happening, then you feel so proud that we've done something for Buddhism. We've made it bigger, better. You know that because I was down in Margaret River a couple of hours ago. And one of my uh, ex monks saw was making the introduction. And he was trying to be very nice and trying to inspire people about all the things I've done in my life as a monk. One of those things which I did as a monk was establishing, helping establish the ordination of bhikkhunis. And because of that, this is female nuns. I don't know if how many of you know this. But a couple of years ago, one of uh, my uh, followers, she was uh, an ex-lawyer, but she's really trying to do something to help Buddhism in Western oh, no, Australia, the whole of the state. So she, uh, she put my name down to get what's the equivalent of the OBE, the Order of Australia. And when she said, I don't need any more medals or anything, you don't become a monk for accolades, for honours. But she said, this is not about you. Because she wanted to get this recognition for supporting gender equality in the religion of which I'm a leader. And I passed right through and I received that medal. And to get like the equivalent of order, it's the order of Australia. It's the equivalent of the OBE in UK. To be able to get that for a good reason allows me to actually to promote that reason even stronger. It's a Katina day at um, 
that the Anukampa Bikuni project. It's not really Katina Day because Katina, you need a place and you need sort of at least four or five nuns to do the Katina for your day Bikunis. This is a dream we have. We call it end of the rains retreat ceremony, a traditional ceremony done in the time of the Buddha where the lay community would come to the, their temple. It's, it's really hard work, <laughs> Venerable Bikuni Chanda, as you know. But to have all those people come there and you welcome them all. And they tell you just how your monks and nuns have served, served big time. And they, this is their way of saying thank you. It's their way of saying thank you to Venerable Chanda that she supported you, even though she's on retreat. You know, she's answered emails sometimes. She's done newsletters and stuff. And if you look at the amount of work which she has done, why? That's what a monastic does, a disciple of Buddha does. We do work hard, we serve. And sometimes I look at myself and I just, well, 70 year old monk now, I'm still working hard. And I was telling people in the talk this afternoon, my motto, my motto, which I live by, is no peace for the wicked. <laughs> of course, I'm a wicked. I give a very high morality. If that's, this is what it's like being good, I'd hate to be wicked. Too much hard work, too much suffering. But all this incredible stuff you can do. So anyone who's depressed, who's down, who feels a lost hope in our world, who feels this difficulty either with COVID or with climate change or with our leadership in our politics. How many people can you trust these days? And now you sort of look at the leaders, the two leaders you see in the top corner here, Venerable Chandra and myself. Now, I've been a monk for 47 years. And so you know, any faults which I have, they'd have been known by now. I'm a moral person, and Venal Chandra is, otherwise I would not support her. And you have two good leaders here who are working tirelessly to try and inspire, support, and make great things happen. It's not just for the future of Buddhism or the future of equity in our world. It is for, for you to inspire you just how much we can work and how much happiness we get from that. When you see how much happiness is generated by goodness, by honesty, morality, how much happiness is given by service. Oh, you know, when I was a, a student, there was a Tibetan nun came and I listened to her talk and she wasn't talking much Dhamma in a sense of Four Noble Truths or dependent origination and stuff like that. What she was talking was how she was running an orphanage in Sikkim or somewhere for some, some kids who had no parents. And I was so inspired. This is like Buddhism in action, kindness, compassion. When I saw that, the I, I got all the details from her. And the following morning, I think I got, I, I cannot remember exactly, but at least 10 pounds out of my bank account I was a student, I was poor, my father was dead, my mother was just scraping by in a council flat. And that was two weeks food money. And, and I, I got the check and presented it to her you know, in the currency she needed, I forget exactly what it was there. And the, I, I went hungry because of that. I'm not starving, but didn't eat as much as I wanted to. And that was the best £10 I'd ever spent in my life. And I remember it to this day. And it still gives me happiness. That's one of the reasons why you don't, please don't offer money uh, or any donations if Aya Chanda builds a beautiful uh, mansion with diamonds and with chandeliers and stuff which you know is extravagant. But a normal place where you feel happy to go to, a place which is quiet, a place where you do have toilets that work, that are clean, that they pass all the regulatory requirements, 
in a place where <laughs> uh, I can't resist this story. Over in Bodhinyana Monastery, years ago, this gentleman came, I'd never seen him before, and he announced that he was worked for the local council. He was a building uh, inspector, the person who would sign off on our buildings to make sure they would stand up. And he said, I'd never seen us, but he'd seen our plans and signed off on them many times. The only reason he came to see me, see me was to say thank you. He wasn't even a Buddhist, but he said that every time, every time he got stressed out at work, instead of getting angry or going to the pub and taking a beer, he would actually come to the car park of our monastery. He came to the car park and all he did was just sit there quietly with the windows open. He said, because your monastery car park was so peaceful. Or somehow or other, I, got, I could feel the, the quiet, safe, accepting energy there. And that was my way I dealt with stress and depression. Your car park. He said, I'm retiring tomorrow. But the last thing I needed to do before I retire was come and say thank you. Sometimes people don't realize the power of good people, people you can trust, a place where you can feel safe, and a place where you don't even need to go and ask a question. If you're in your car, go and sit in the car park until the problem disappears all by itself. It's the energy, the atmosphere of the place. That's what really helps. That's one of the reasons, you know, you may not be retiring, but it's like, you know, the time, the end of the range retreat where you can say thank you. You can say how much you appreciate what's been done. And after a while you think, well, if I was say thank you to Venerable Chanda, she'll get a big head. It never works that way with praise, with people coming to support, you know, your hard work and say thank you to you. What happens, it does encourage you to work even harder. You don't get a big heart. You don't get a big head, you get a big heart. And that's one of the reasons why, when you understand the purpose of praise and how to deal with it, it is actually to encourage you to say, yeah, amazing job, well done. And please may you always accept praise when it's given to you. Human beings today, they accept criticism, criticism so easily. And most of the criticism which I've heard other people say of each other is not really merited at all. It's you know, just sometimes people are upset and angry, they want to put you down. If they put you down, then they're not so, so much below you. And it's a little story. Please, again, me telling these stories, but they really meant a lot to me. Because this particular story, uh, when I uh, went to meet uh, the president of Sri Lanka at the time, that was uh, Rajapaksa, the previous one, Mahinda Rajapaksa. And he, he wanted us to do some merit to serve me breakfast. No venerable Chanda knows what he served me with his own hand. The president of Sri Lanka served me a couple of spoons of baked beans. It was not hoppers or any other food, but it was that food, baked beans. And afterwards I told him a story. I told him the story of the donkey who fell in the well. Many of you may have heard his story before, especially Ayachanda, but you haven't heard the story as many times as I have heard it. <laughs> Every time I say it, I hear it. But this donkey fell in the well and luckily, the well had no water in it. It was a dry well. And secondly, the donkey wasn't badly injured. It could stand up, but then how can a donkey climb out of a well? So the donkey started shouting as loud as he could, Eeyore, 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 which in donkey language means help. And after a long time before the donkey got hoarse, <laughs> no, no, that was not a joke. That was, that was really, before the donkey got a sore throat. 
<laughs> but I, I, a farmer heard that donkey. And the farmer, where's that noise coming from? He looked inside the well. And he saw the donkey at the bottom of the well. Now that farmer was not a nice man at all. And he thought, that's a very dangerous well. But that's a very unpleasant donkey. I can, as they say, kill two birds with one stone. I hate that saying, kill two birds with one stone. If you're a Buddhist, please say, cut two carrots with the same knife. <laughs> <laughs> we don't like killing anything. So anyway, <laughs> so the farmer said, I'm going to fill up that well and kill the donkey at the same time. So he got a spade out and started shoveling dirt all over the donkey throwing mud at him. And as soon as the donkey was, the farm wasn't helping him, he was trying to bury him and shouted out even louder, ee-oh, ee-oh, ee-oh. And then after a few minutes, the donkey fell quiet. And the farmer thought he'd buried the donkey. But that's not what had happened. The donkey had some wisdom, what we call insight. Insight is not just being enlightened or impressing your friends with your knowledge of Four Noble Truths. It's what saves your life. So what the donkey did, the next shovel full of dirt over his head, he just shrugged it off, stamped it in, and he was one centimeter higher. Another shovel full of dirt, shake it off, Stamp it in, and it was higher. Another shovel full, another centimeter higher. And the farmer was not really paying attention. He wasn't mindful. He was thinking of other stuff he needed to do and how clever he was to get rid of the donkey in the well, the dry well at the same time. And so the farmer never noticed a pair of donkey ears come up from the top of the well. The donkey kept quiet. But soon the donkey was high enough to jump out of the well. And please excuse me, but this is how I read it. And to, to, to demonstrate the law of karma by, uh, by biting the farmer on the bottom. And the moral of the story, you must always watch your ass. <laughs> Is that what they call donkeys, asses? <laughs> And that's what you call a bottom in Britain. <laughs> when, when I told her, when I told that to the president of Sri Lanka, he burst out laughing. He said, when anybody criticizes you, try your very best to do good things and don't sort of bend the rules to suit yourself. And remember, in positions of power, you must not harm others. But a lot of times you will be criticized for things you didn't do. If that happens, don't get upset. Just shrug it off, stamp it in, and you're a centimeter higher. Now, how many of you listening to this have been criticized unfairly for things you didn't do? And you shout back, you complain. It doesn't get you anywhere. Instead, stamp it in. Now shrug it off, stamp it in, and you're always a centimeter higher. A centimeter closer to freedom. So this is one little story which is so easy to say, but which actually helps people and which creates more happiness and peace in the world. And there are many other stories which I can't say, which I don't even understand, because I'm a man. I've got limited experience. There's many other stories which Ronald Chandler can't say, I mean, because he's not LGBTQIA+. That's why we need a diversity in our communities and people willing to share, people willing to, to support. And after a while, when we do that, we finally have a huge amount of people who are happy. This is a weird thing. Last Sunday I had Architina in Perth, 1,500 people, maybe 2,000. Today, two talks, four houses both times. People standing in the back. I remember going to places like in Melbourne University, 
that always stands out because I came early and the the guards or the the people who are supposed to the security people, they came late. So all the students came in. I said, no, oh, you can get two in a seat. You can sort of sit in the aisles. And by the time the security came in and started announcing, you're not allowed to sit in the, on the stairs and in the aisles. It was way too late. So all the security could do was to, to close the doors. We had a full house, about twice as many as was probably allowed in the lecture theatre in Melbourne University. And then through the glass doors of that venue, I always remember the, the professor who'd organized it. He was waving at me through the glass doors. Even the professor couldn't get in. <laughs> we had a wonderful time there. Everyone behaved, it was safe, but the atmosphere was electric as often it is when you get a full house and more than a full house, people sitting on the stairs behaving themselves but the energy was huge. Why? This is not a rock concert, this is Buddhism. This is Dharma. It doesn't just enjoy it for a moment. It actually, you, you get Dharma healing, inspiration, especially inspiration. Because the inspiration is what it strengthens your immune system. This young girl told me this the other day, she's in university, said, yeah, that's true. You know, if you're inspired and you're happy, you smile. Yeah, you know, that's her field of study. Your immune response gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And there's many things you need to strengthen your immune system for in our modern world. It's not just that, it's just your health. You, you don't get depressed. And Venerable Chanda, how long have you known me? Mm. Have you ever have you ever seen me depressed and unhappy? Never. I should be, because I'm really treated unfairly. It's 70 years old now, I should retire. <laughs> I'm not allowed to retire. But I don't want to, you're enjoying yourself. So anyway, you say that honestly, because this is what happens when you serve, when you give. You always get far more back in return. I do anyway, than what I give to others. So each one listening here, this is the end of the Rains Retreat. This Rains Retreat, for the Anukampa Bhikkhuni Project. There'll be many more in the future, and bigger and bigger with more nuns, more bhikkhunis, anagarikas, training, you as well, visiting, going on retreats, not just getting counseling, but getting peace. It's far more powerful. We talk too much, especially me. Today, I was asked, why do I talk so much? Even telling silly jokes or you know, giving sermons and stuff. And I said, it's very obvious. It's, I'm 70 years old now. <laughs> when you get old, your eyes get weak, you need glasses to see. Your ears, you need you know, earbuds or something so that you can hear properly. Uh, you know, you can't sometimes move your hands because you, know, you get some damage playing uh, sports or something with your hands. You can't walk properly. You have to have knee replacements, hip replacements. Your tummy is very difficult. You get bugs in your tummy and you only need to eat special foods and stuff. You're, your body starts to fall apart as you get old, except, except for one thing. I notice there's one part of a human body which gets stronger and stronger with every year. <laughs> <laughs> your mouth. <laughs> old people can talk a long time. <laughs> and I put my hand up, that's me too. I can speak much longer, talk much longer now than I could as a 40 year old or a 30 year old. And so could Venable Chanda as well. Probably. <laughs> 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 but as long as you talk good stuff, that's brilliant. And then that's a service for others a service of non judging kindness. And I finish off with a beautiful story my father told me before he passed away. 
whatever happens to you in your life, the door of my heart will always be open to you. You meant that. And oof, I don't know if you really understand that, but for me, that was just a life changer. It was some person who had unconditional love for me. No matter what I ever did. He was proud of me. If he was embarrassed about me, that was not the point. No judging, just unconditional love. And of course, every time I see any one of you, I always try to express that unconditional love by giving you, you know, you're really tired. Every time that you see us, hopefully that unconditional love rubs off. So you learn something which is beautiful in this life. Most importantly, to yourself. To be able to say to yourself at the end of the rains retreat, whatever's happened the last few months, whoever I am, whatever I've done, I love myself. I accept myself. I'm warm to myself. And if any of you ever get, ever get depressed or upset, you have to live by yourself day after day after day. Try this little exercise. You put your arms out and you follow me and you bring your arms in and give yourself a big hug. <laughs> As a monk, I'm not allowed to hug anybody, but I can hug myself. <laughs> During COVID, you've got to have social distancing but not from yourself. You get sued and put in jail sometimes for assault if you hug somebody, but never if you hug yourself. And it works. It works for me anyway. I do it with honesty. I give myself this wonderful acceptance and kindness. The door of my heart is open to me as well. Those are the things you learn. And lastly, because you know, to get a nice place for Venerable Chanda, for all the people who would be uh, practicing with her in the future, in the future years, all those people, I will say to you all, that the door of Anukampa Bikuni Project's donation box and online, <laughs> online service is also open to you all. <laughs> you can't take it with you. It gives you so much joy. I went hungry giving some stuff to these orphans. Wonderful thing to do. So that's what we do this time of the year. Give. Even though it's hard. It is hard for me to give my time this evening. Any sensible monk will be in bed by now. It's late here in uh, Western Australia. And I've been working my butt off all day. Doesn't matter. This is what we do. Okay. <laughs> so now, well, what do we do next? We do a guided meditation or questions or? I think uh, the program is for the guided meditation, Ajahn, because we thought that's the best way to make good use yeah. of your time. And uh, okay, so, maybe... so we have yeah, two or three minutes or five minutes break. So you can stretch your legs or go to the toilet, whatever you need to do. Oh, sorry, we don't call it toilet in Buddhism. We call it the letting go room. So if you want to go to the letting go room, the toilet, in other words, please <laughs> go and take a nice rest. A nice rest in the restroom. That's the American way to say it. Yeah, I think it's great. Restroom, yeah. Yeah, so you can go and stay in there as long as you like. <laughs> Especially if you're constipated. I don't mean physically, I mean mentally constipated. With anger and upset and you're tired, go in there and take a rest yeah. in the restroom. The, the, your boss asks you why you spend so much time in there. Oh, you know, because it's a restroom. I need to rest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was some good advice, Ajahn, that you gave me after the rains to take five minutes whenever possible. Even if I don't have... Uh, time to meditate for an hour, but just to sit for five minutes with the eyes closed and making peace with the experience. Yeah. At your desk, computer can still be on, they won't sort of uh, remind you to do something, you just close your eyes. 
And if you do things like that, take many small rests during the day, you find you have more energy in the evening. Yeah. And also the other thing is never get negative. You think, oh, why do I have to do this? And the other thing like that is monastery. You say, do you think, thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this. You always look in a positive way. That saves you know, energy, doesn't it? Saves mental yeah. energy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Working. Again, I can't go to bed yet, but in half an hour, when this part of the session finishes, I'll be going into the cave where I live and laying down, and I'll be fast asleep in a couple of minutes. <laughs> How many of you can sleep like that? You're gone from the world. <laughs> a good rest. You wake up in the morning, nice and fresh again for another day of hard work. <laughs> There's more stuff to worry. <laughs> but I don't mind because you see the benefits in it. The one thing which I didn't really emphasize as much is if you can get involved in something, then you're serving something, something which is, I keep saying this, I know, but this is incredible. A big community monastery. Wow. I kind of don't know why more people don't get involved in that and make it happen. Yeah. Because in it's, the end, you think the karma you've done, the goodness you've done, what you've added in this world, that's huge. Yeah, sometimes we have no idea, actually, about the long-term effects, you know? It's almost impossible Ooh. to to imagine. Huge. Mm. And one of the reasons for that is, look, just little things, like just improving people's health. Just again, today there's one lady. Um, she, she's actually been to, to visit you before. I won't say who she is. Mm -hmm. But she was saying okay. she got uh, breast cancer. And without the meditation and the inspiration, oh, she'd be in a big trouble. But it just makes it easy to bear. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to say that, but that's what she says. So, and look at how many women are listening to this talk tonight. And how many of you have experienced breast cancer if you haven't already? That's the truth of the matter. And how many men will get prostate cancer or have already got it? Don't be afraid. If you learn how to do some meditation, it's not that hard to cure diseases. I'm not just saying that as some salesman you know, trying to get the latest drug to which cures everything. This is stuff which I've seen over many, many years. Seen when people just have, <laughs> have uncurable cancers. And then they just meditate instead, become peaceful, change their life, their lifestyle, and they're free. Other people don't believe them. Say so maybe you didn't really have cancer, or maybe it's an anomaly. But they know it's something completely different. And that's what you get from these sorts of practices. That's why sometimes I feel guilty if I don't give talks when I'm tired, to give more talks. Because when people come up and tell you what happened to them, it blows your mind. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, I think it looks like people are pretty much back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can start it then. Okay. So how long for half an hour? Or? Yeah, that would be lovely. And then. Okay. You... Yeah. If any questions afterwards, because what? <laughs> this is crazy stuff. When I'm really exhausted and give, I get energy back. So I'm much more energized now than I was half an hour ago. <laughs> so let's see, maybe do a few Q and A afterwards. See how what you happens. feel. Yeah. yeah, I'm happy to do that, Ajahn. It's in the program. Okay. But if you if you wish, I'm sure no one will complain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But take care of but, yourself as well. Yeah. If I fall asleep during the meditation, please forgive me. You know <laughs> what I've been doing today. You'd understand. 
<laughs> Maybe so we can just have it lightly guided, Ajahn. You don't need to guide the whole thing. Yeah. No, it keeps me awake. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I may get to the point where I just get really deep. Yeah. So anyway, you start by closing your eyes, reminding yourself this is your meditation time. It's not a time for writing your autobiography or for working out problems. Problems are worked out at the end of the meditation, never at the beginning. And one of the most difficult things which stops you seeing clearly is stress. So we're going to deal with that first of all. The stress, the tiredness, not so much in our body, but in our mind. So we start with our body. How do you feel in your body, physically? Yeah, how nice you are. You start with your feet. Where are your feet right now? With your eyes closed, you can be far more sensitive to the position of your feet. My feet were just really um, uncomfortable, so I moved them. It's okay to move at the beginning of the meditation. Now my feet feel way more comfortable. How's your ankles? What do they feel like? How's your calves? At this point, it starts getting really interesting for me because I've been a monk for such a long time, meditating before I became a monk. It's over 50 years of meditation I've been doing now, so my awareness is very strong. I can feel my legs. I can feel the calves. They were uncomfortable. They've been doing a lot of work today. I can feel them. Now I just imagine just feeling them and giving them kindness. Care. If you don't know what kindness is, try many different things until you find what makes that those legs feel more relaxed, more at peace, more strong. So my calves are now much, much more stronger than a couple of minutes ago. Still feel some sensations in my left calf. I just focus on them. Get some loving kindness. Cars, I cannot complain because I have overused you sitting in cars traveling for such a long time today, like five or six hours just in a car. Until the legs, that feeling disappears, things relax. You look at your knees. Some people do have to have operations on their body because they played aggressive sports or been in accidents. I see that happen so often in meditation, especially meditation retreats, that people start to feel heat in that part of the body and other parts of the body. So just your knees get uncommonly warm. You feel it. And all that is, is the body putting its limited energy into one place to heal you. And people do experience strange sensations in the body. If they feel comfortable, they feel non-threatening. Just let them be. Don't try and get rid of them because you don't understand them. Part of meditation is learning. You're not supposed to understand it at the beginning. But learning and trust, it feels good, keep going. Until my knees now feel so incredibly relaxed, like they've been soaking in hot water. And your thighs, I don't know why, but my thighs feel at ease, at peace. Go up to your, your bottom. How does that feel? Especially if I ever do long meditations, I really make sure the bottom is really comfortable to begin with. Because at times when my bottom was, I was neglecting it, sometimes I would cut off some blood supply to the nerve endings and my leg would go to sleep. It would get numb. And all the problem was I wasn't really aware of how I positioned my buttocks at the beginning of the meditation, that was all. So now make sure the buttocks are comfortable. 
to ensure that I sometimes ask them. I'm not a dumb monk. I'm not crazy. I ask buttocks, how are you? You need to be adjusted. Now, every time I ask a question like that of my body and listen, there's always an answer. And I follow that answer as if the buttocks were an individual conscious entity who can answer these questions honestly and accurately. And once I hear from my buttocks, they're comfortable, I leave them alone. Then I go and uh, look at my back. I just adjusted the headphone in my ear because it was falling out. I'm always happy to adjust, interfere in the sense at the beginning. Making sure my buttock, my back feels good. Again, many times I keep a straight back. But this evening, because of maybe traveling in a car, it's the only way to get these long distances in Australia. So I just look at my back, feel it, and realize this is a comfortable position for it right now. It likes to be just leaning against the chair. And I look at my, my torso and all the organs inside, from the intestines and the colon and the bladder and the, uh, I'm not going to give a medical anatomy lesson. I just scan my attention up my own body if I find somewhere it's not comfortable, I pause. My stomach, my lungs, my heart, they're pretty much at ease, at peace. I go past them, relaxing my shoulders, looking at my arms and hands, how are they situated? Often when I sit on the floor, so my hands can go on my, my lap. Because I'm sitting at a desk now to let you see me on the internet. I got my hands on the table, but they're comfortable. I make sure they're comfortable. Any adjustments, hands, there we go, just a small one. Now they're at ease. And I go to my neck. And my neck is irritated at the moment because of tiredness and because this is the time the farmers here are making hay. It's a season for, for reaping the crops. And I'm physically tired. And that makes me more susceptible to hay fever. I can feel the little blockage in my nose and the itch in my throat. I can feel it. So what I do is try and care for it. Relax those areas. Send them warmth and loving kindness. It always works. The itch in the throat gets less. And the blockage in the nose gets relieved. It works every time. It really encourages me to share this with you. When I teach guided meditation, it's not theory. It's what I actually do. But I guide myself. When I go to the front of my face, because many of your muscles in your face are screwed up because of emotional problems, negativity, or even because of fear. You can read a person's state of mind simply by looking at their facial features. So I'm aware of the muscles around my mouth and my nose especially, and my eyes. 
by relaxing to the max. If you have strong enough mindfulness, you can feel the muscles relaxing. The sensory experience around the eyes, and around the mouth and the nose change. It's like your, your muscles aren't, aren't holding tight to things. They're at ease, they're relaxed, they're open. They feel so much better. And some of the emotions begin to calm down as well. But before I leave the body, I look at it as a whole. The toes to my nose, from my back, all over the body, making sure it's comfortable. Even this much is beautiful meditation. Being aware of my body, having relaxed it quite deeply, and everything feels at ease. It's not just at ease. It is resilient. If you have a guitar string which is pulled tight, when something falls on that guitar string, it makes a high pitch bing. But if that guitar string is loosened, if something falls on it, boom, a low tone. If that guitar string has no tension in it at all, when something hits it, it makes no sound at all. That's the meaning of resilience. When you're relaxed, at peace, your body becomes healthy. When your mind is at ease, at peace, it gets resilience too. Things hit it metaphorically. You don't react. You're at ease. So how peaceful is your mind right now? How peaceful are you in this moment? What is peace? What makes your mind more peaceful? Learning how to be in this moment and now. The past, people never remember the past accurately. They always add some more details which never happened. They take some things away. The past is unreliable. So you don't learn from the past as much as you learn from the present, from now. And the future which is fantasy. What do you think should happen? I don't know how many times I've been disappointed. People say this is going to happen, it never does. Experts I'm talking about. So I can't rely on the future. I can't rely on the past. But I do know but now, this moment, is where my future is being made. My happiness, my health, my energy is being constructed right now. I have a good attitude to this moment. Kindness, letting go, renunciation gentleness. The Buddha said that's the best way of looking at this moment. 
It's called the second, the second factor of the Eightfold Path. And don't judge yourself or compare yourself or compare this meditation with the last one. That just creates more stress. And meditate for the opposite. No stress at all. Open the door of your heart to this moment. Whatever it is, however you feel, don't try and suppress it. Don't be ashamed of it. Just be with it with kindness. Become a friend of your body and a friend of your mind. So you trust each other and don't need to change. Let this moment be with kindness. It will grow all by itself. And if you're meditating, please remember who you are meditating for. It's not just yourself. It's all the people you serve and help in the world. To your health and well-being. So you do not need to cause distress to others. Caring for yourself is one of the best ways to care for others. If you don't know how to care for yourself, how can you ever know and understand how to care for others? So you're meditating not just for yourself, you're meditating for the benefit of all beings big and small. How do you feel now? When you become peaceful, does it feel joyful? Do you feel pleasurable? If it does, well done. That's what's supposed to happen. It's the pleasure of meditation. It allows the mind to rest there. You stay there without any effort. There's a joy which holds you there, not your ego. The more you let go and be kind, the more of that joy you feel.
So now, now see if you could be aware of the next three breaths, breathing in and breathing out the next three times. At the end of the third breath, open your eyes to end the meditation. There we go. Well, thank you for that opportunity. That was nice. And if ever you're doing a meditation that's really going deep, just carry on. Don't disturb it because of what I say or because of people ringing gongs. Carry on. Okay, so I uh, feel energized enough for the next 10 minutes. Is there any questions you would like to ask me? Have you got so, some questions already? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the, the way to do this will be to send them to Derek, but if that's going to take a bit of time, maybe they should send it straight to me, Derek. What do you think? Yeah. So you can directly message me or Derek and make it short if you can, because I think Ajahn, he'll be only here for 10, 15 10 minutes. minutes. Yeah. After that, um, you can send them. To, after that, we'll have a little tea break and then we can send questions to Derek for me. OK. Great. So, so I do have one here. I'm just trying to change my, to read it properly. Yes. OK. Uh, okay, it's quite long. Okay, this is quite long. <laughs> I have a slight problem that I'm not entirely sure how to deal with. I'm in a long distance relationship and my partner has told his mom about me, but there's one problem. He refers to me as a guy friend who used to study in his school. None of this is true and these lies have been going on for a year and every time he talks about me, he refers to me as a he. Yeah. His mom is really strict and forbids him, forbids him from talking to girls in school, let alone online. So when she heard about this so-called guy friend, she was really happy and has been frequently asking my partner about me. As much as I'm happy that she's interested in me, I'm sad to put her in, under the impression that I'm a guy. <laughs> Since the truth will hurt her a lot, what's the best to do yeah. in this situation? I don't know. You could actually just... Uh, say to her, well, I can't say that's more lies. I was going to say you've just been over to Bangkok and had a change. Can't say things like that. I'm getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> yeah, it just sometimes if, I don't know how old you are and your mum, look, all the mums, sorry? His mum. I think it's his mum that doesn't want him to have a girlfriend or something. Well, look, I don't know what type of mum that is, honestly, because you know, the job of a mother is to trust their kids and to give them that trust. And the job of the kid is to live up to that trust. Look, when I was 17 years of age, my father had died. I'd already got a place up in Cambridge, a scholarship up there, but I had about nine months where I had nothing to do. So I got a job, earned a bit of money, and I had a guitar and a backpack and went hitchhiking over North Africa. And my mother let me do that it was with her um, full approval. And she trusted me. And I lived up to that trust. And so your kid, always remind them that trust is a very valuable commodity but give it and if the person can fulfill that trust and live up to it they get so much more freedom in life there was these two sri lankan girls the, their father had died i was with him when he passed away and that they were 18 and they wanted to go to a nightclub to with their friends to enjoy themselves their mother was really to very traditional uh, Sinhalese, was very concerned. 
So they asked me to talk to their mum. And I said, look, these are really good girls. They've been you know, brought up well. And in front of their mother, I asked them, would you ever take any alcohol? They said, no, we wouldn't take any alcohol. Drugs? Oh, no, not even drugs. You know, we know the dangers. You know, we just want to go out and have some fun, do some dancing, chatting, laughing. And I trusted them, and I told their mother, you should trust them as well. And they went. And they had a wonderful time. Eventually, when they grew up, because one of them is now a doctor in London, whenever I, whenever I go over to London, hopefully you can go there soon. And then, but she always makes a point of checking in with me. And the other one, I keep remembering where, forgetting where she is now, but she is a very, very good woman too. Both married with kids and having a wonderful life. Kids, I mean, yeah, the, the, uh, your children do need to have boyfriends and girlfriends. Make sure they've got good ones. And they're very useful. I'll tell this little story. There was this one, <laughs> one man, one of our uh, regulars in, in Perth, and uh, he told me that his son had a girlfriend but he was spending so much time with his girlfriend, he wasn't doing his homework at university. And his grades were getting worse and worse and worse. And because of that, because they were getting worse, mother and father tried to tell their son that you better do much better, much more work, and don't spend so much time going out with your girlfriend. And that was just like uh, speaking to a deaf young man. He heard it, but he'd made, made no impression on him at all. So one, one day the father waited up. And when his son came back home with his girlfriend, very politely, very kindly, he said, oh, can you both come into the house? Because I want to have a chat with both of you. And he told his, mostly speaking to the girlfriend rather than his son, saying, I don't know, just no how you feel about one another, but I've been noticing you've been going out together for a long time now. And also, I want to tell you that, you know, my son's grades at university are going really well grown down. And his uh, lecturers are saying that he could fail. Did you know that? And the girlfriend said, no, I never knew that at all. I thought he was doing okay. I just thought I'd let you know, because I'm sure that if things work out between you and you get married, you don't want to marry a boy who's doing no good at life. I said, no, of course I don't. I want him to have a degree. Okay, good night, both of you. And from that day on, his son's girlfriend always asked him, what was the result of your assignment? What's your grades are do doing? He would not listen to his mum and dad but my goodness, he would listen to his girlfriend. Or if you're a girl, the boyfriend. So whoever that is, you know, if you tell your mum the amount of leverage you have over your child once he has a girlfriend or a boyfriend, she might actually think, oh, yeah, it's a good idea having a girlfriend or a boyfriend. That way, I'm sure that I have more influence over my children. So anyway, that worked for them. He passed his exam, no problem at all. Got a good degree. So okay. for those of you are mothers or fathers and have kids, you notice how they don't listen to you. But don't talk to them directly. Go to their girlfriends or their boyfriends. And then the boyfriend has full power over them. <laughs> anyway. Okay, there's quite a few questions. And as I say, Ajahn, I, I can answer most. Yeah. But do you want another? Yeah, go on. Okay. What is the difference between loving attention and controlling the mind? Thank you. Loving attention and controlling the mind. I don't think I really understand that one. Because controlling the mind, you don't never control the mind. If you try to control the mind, the mind will rebel. You don't want it to rebel. Look, for so many years when I meditated, now I was taught always to, if the mind wanders off, bring it back. It wanders off, bring it back. That's controlling. Do it softly. That's still controlling. Instead, I've used wisdom. 
Why does my mind wander off? It's because I had a bad relationship with it. I was always telling it what to do. So instead of controlling the mind, I tried loving the mind, caring for it. And to the mind respected me so much, we hang out together as best friends. When you're having a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or a dinner with your best friend, do you always control them and tell them what to do and what to eat and how long to sit there for? You never do that. You just enjoy their company and time flies by. That's what happens when I meditate. I enjoy the company of being inside. We're good friends. I care for my mind. I care for my breath. I care for all these other parts of meditation. So we hang out together like best friends for a long time without any effort at all. Effort's not needed. Okay. There's, a, there's another very interesting question that you might not have ever had put to you before. Would you like okay. it or not? Yeah, go on. And then we'll well. end with a joke. But I need the answer to the joke. The person who sent the joke needs to send me the answer so I can uh, say the whole okay. thing. <laughs> okay. Okay, <laughs> so, so this is an interesting one. So I'm going to have a baby soon. Could you please tell me some words that I can remember during labour? I know you haven't had a baby, let alone given birth, but I think you would do very well if you had to. <laughs> yeah. First of all, do, for yourself, never call it labour pains. Call it labour energy. Labour energy. It's like going to the toilet to do a number two. <laughs> but, you know, double that. And it's this amazing thing. This is, you're giving birth, you're giving birth to life. It's an incredible experience. And just merge with those feelings. Do not resist them. Care for them. This is the most important thing in my life in this moment right now. So don't try and force anything. Care. Love these feelings and don't call them pain. Find another word for them. And then get everybody around. And when you do a big one, a big contraction, don't call it contraction, a big birth energy. Make sure everyone that's around is cheering you on. Yay, come on. Yeah, you can do this. Yeah, come on. Because that sort of stuff works. But you don't look at this pain, you don't resist it, you don't tighten up, which causes even more some difficulty. You lighten up and regard this as a beautiful moment in your life. Don't call it as pain. So I have half a, half a joke here, I think. So yeah, I'll okay. give you the half a joke and see if you get the answer. Um, okay, otherwise, it'll have to hang on for the next session. <laughs> <laughs> a skeleton doesn't want to go to the dance. Why? Uh, yeah, it's got nothing to wear. <laughs> because he had no body to dance with. Okay. Oh, okay. And that's from Hula Girl. Oh, yeah. Tay. Very nice. <laughs> she's called herself Hula Girl, especially for you. Yeah, okay. no, she's, a, she's an incredible woman. She's a yes. professor over in uh, Hawaii somewhere. Indeed. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So, are you tired and ready for your rest yeah. now, Ajahn? Okay. I think so, yeah. So, so, thank you so much on behalf good of night, everybody. everybody. <laughs> good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. So, we'll <laughs> let you good. go before we have a Very break. Good. Okay. <laughs> Take care. Thank, you, so thank you, Ajahn. Bye. Great. So, Ajahn will be leaving, disappearing in true style. And uh, for us, it's time for a little tea break. So there are a lot of questions that have come to me or that have come to Ajahn. I'm not sure um, if you would ask them to me or not, or you might want to put something different to me. I think it might be easiest if uh, people now type in their questions for me and send them to Derek, and then I can answer the ones that I know you want me to. So I will ignore the other questions. If it's important to you, please send it to Derek and I will answer it after the tea. So let's have a tea break. 
and you can have some time away from the screen if you wish or you can just bring your tea right back and I'll start straight away so I'm going to get me a cup of tea and I'll start pretty soon after that so that we can get through as many as possible great give yourself time you know the fighting them the the fighting them and the tensing up. Okay, the recording started again. So we're talking about difficult emotions. So when we um, tense up around them or when we fight them, of course, they intensify, right? Because we're actually resisting them. And even when we tell ourselves, I must defend them, you know, you're giving yourself pressure. You're, you're expecting results straight away. And I think it's important to go gently and give yourself time. Yeah, Sometimes it might be enough just to sit with a painful emotion for five minutes. You know, you just sit there for five minutes and then say, okay, well done, dear. You did well. You've been with it for five minutes. Now I'm just going to change my position or go outside, look at the sky, enjoy the autumn, have a cup of tea and, you know, go back to it at another time. So really go gently don't judge yourself for this and understand that this is very natural it's a really important part of the path so it's a learning process right we can't get it right straight away we just learn it as we work with these things and you know that you have the right attitude when you're able to open up to them allow them to be there and because you're allowing it things generally start to lose their power they lose their grip on you they stop disturbing you or causing you to suffer and gradually they fade away, yeah? But we don't skip a step. We don't stay with it so that it fades away. We stay with it with a genuine curiosity and kindness. And as a result, over time, it starts to fade. So someone's asking if I have a place to stay now. Are we taking any live-in volunteers? So at this point in the project, this is your job because obviously a lot of people would like to come and stay. So if you would like to come and stay, please help us find somewhere. So it is an exciting time in the project because we have some more funds now. We actually received another donation from an anonymous donor. So we have just about enough to get because the house prices here are now terrible so but we have enough to get a fairly decent sized house with maybe five or six bedrooms hopefully and a big um living room which could act as a dama hall some of the properties we've looked at have got sort of outbuildings like barns or sheds that could potentially be changed into a dama hall a place to meditate um some places have a lot of land too much land <laughs> some places don't have enough so we're looking very actively and we have a wonderful team of volunteers so we've been through probably hundreds and hundreds of properties in the last few months and I've had a look as well since my retreat and during a little bit as well and so we are on the case and it's just a matter of finding something that we think will be both tranquil quiet relaxing and accessible for people to get to. But absolutely, we would love to have um, long-term volunteers once we have a place. And um, I mean, if you are interested in that in a serious way, you can always write into our team. I think Derek can put the team at email address in the box. And you know, you can write in, you can fill out an application form, tell us what your skills are, tell us what your background is a little bit. And when we do have a place, you know, we can um, invite you, first of all, for a short stay, maybe over seven days, and then if it works, you can stay for longer, a month, even three months, who knows. So anything is possible, you know, once we have this place. And if we know that, you know, there are serious practitioners who are interested, this will help us to have the confidence to go ahead, and it will help to speed things up. So it's a bit of chicken or the egg at the moment, you know, which comes first, the people or the place. But I think bit by bit, both are starting to come together and, uh, and hopefully we'll have enough support on the ground. So please do keep in touch, you know, and if you find any property that you feel is uh, promising, you can send that in to us. We can't always reply directly, individually, because we have a lot of work at the moment, um, but we will, you know, be very grateful to receive any... Uh, any inspiring news for many of you, okay? Okay, so someone's asking, in our tradition, if a woman is over 50 who loves the Dharma, loves to serve, could she still be ordained? Thank you very much. In theory, yes. 
it depends how much over 50 uh, a person is and also on the community. It really depends on the community more than anything else. Um, one of the things we look for in candidates is somebody who's healthy, who has um, some energy, who loves the Dhamma. I mean, for me, that's the best qualification of all, someone who loves the Dhamma and loves to serve. Um, and it will be a kind of case by case thing. We have to get to know you, you have to get to know us. And it's like in any organization, say even in, I don't know, any ordinary job, you need to have a balance of people who are younger and who have like many years ahead of them so that they can contribute, become the future teachers, you know, and also people who are maybe in their older years. Um, the main reason for one of the age restrictions in our tradition that many monasteries have put in place is so that the younger monastics don't burn out by looking after the older monastics, because if people are sort of 60, 70, starting to get into old age and having all kinds of health concerns, we'll basically become carers. And, you know, that's great as a personal practice. Uh, but it's not possible to, you know, to do our other duties and serve the community if we have to take care of one person or two people. So we need a balance in community. But personally, my perspective is that it's more of a case by case. And I think these days, 50 is actually quite young. So if that's you, please don't give up and uh, see if you can find a place that might be suitable because people who are older have a lot to offer. You know, you have the maturity, you have the integration, especially if you have that will to serve. You know, it shows an integrated practice. Okay. So someone's asking how to train one's mind to detach from a difficult relationship. So this is a huge question. And when you're asking about the mind detaching, I'm not sure if you mean just, you know, adopting an attitude whereby that difficult relationship is still there, but you learn for it not to affect you so much. You learn your boundaries, you know, you're able to stay within it and yet be less affected by the difficulties, by the um, hopefully not abuse. There can also be other relationships, of course, where we need to physically detach and move ourselves away. Um, and I think in that case, it's perhaps more difficult to know where that boundary lies. Certainly if you're in any physical danger or if you, you know, if you're experiencing emotional abuse, then um, you need to have support around you. You know, just simply training your mind is not necessarily enough because this is a, it's a com community problem actually that requires community support. So especially if you are in an abusive relationship and um, the time that a person tries to leave that relationship can be the most dangerous of all so please make sure you have people around you start telling people you know in your group of friends or in your community and preparing um, the situation so that you have a lot of support you have somewhere to go to that's safe if you're trying to work mainly with your mind I think sometimes you know the mind is very tricky because we allow ourselves to suffer quite a lot and part of this I think is developing more self-compassion you know I've noticed for myself if I'm down on myself if I don't have enough compassion for myself I might allow myself to stay in a difficult relationship and feel that I almost deserve to suffer and not learn to you know to say enough is enough so I think it often comes from developing a more wholesome relationship with ourselves and developing better boundaries for ourselves. You know, what kind of behaviors and ways of speech and relating to you, you feel are, are, are respectful or acceptable. And, you know, the ways that someone may speak to you that are not acceptable, that don't make you feel valued and nurtured and nourished in that relationship, you know, and then developing a way to try to convey that to your partner or your parent, whoever you're in this difficult relationship with, finding a way to non-violently say to this person, you know, when this happens, I feel uh, sadness or I feel small, I feel, you know, whatever it is, try to get a word that's a feeling word rather than a word that implies a judgment, right? So if you say, I feel disrespected, this is actually not very helpful because you're, you're actually saying that person disrespects you. So instead of that, you can say, I feel small or I feel um, afraid. 
Um, so I would really recommend nonviolent communication as a way to um, try to establish some healthy boundaries and ask for your needs to be met, first of all. So that is, um, there's a book by Marshall Rosenberg, I think it is, called Nonviolent Communication. You might want to look into that. Um, and I guess that's one way to actually work on it through in a relational way. But if you are stuck in a situation and the person doesn't want to change or want to talk, then I think meditation is really important. Yeah, Having a safe space to go to and sit every night or every morning and resource yourself, you know, develop again that beautiful relationship with yourself, a safe space to be with yourself. And, um, and you know, put the boundaries out, lock the door, resource yourself, and then go back into it with a clearer, calmer mind. But I do think on the whole, we tend to um, allow ourselves to be in difficult relationships for far too long. And I know for me in my leadership role, I can't afford to do that because it just gets me drained. And if I'm drained, I can't give to others. So sometimes I have to prioritize the group um, and unfortunately give less to a particular individual, you know, because it, it will drain you if you're in a really unhealthy relationship where you're not valued or respected. So I hope there's something in there that will apply to your particular situation. And I wish you good luck. Make sure you have some good friends around you and spend more time with them if you possibly can. Come to the Dhamma groups, you know, come to places that you feel safe, that you feel supported. And bit by bit, you just might feel like I don't want to move back into any other situation. You start to learn your own true value and worth and slowly move away from that situation. Okay. I was asked by somebody to help out in our village shop a day or so every week. I accepted because I know they're really struggling and they've asked me to start on a Wednesday, but I've really lost my nerve, worried that I won't cope. But I know I'll be helping them so much, so I should do it. <laughs> Could Venerable Chanda say anything to help me feel less stressed and more able to do this, please? Any positive thoughts? Welcome, thank you. Okay, so it sounds as though you've taken something on out of a lot of kindness and compassion for the other. Um, and it's not something you actually were necessarily going to do unless they asked. So this is already a lot of sacrifice and you're doing it out of kindness. Um, and it seems to me from the question that you want to go ahead and do it. You don't want to let them down. So if you still want to try, do try, but please don't invalidate your feelings. Like accept that you are nervous, you know, and accept that this may cause stress and listen to those feelings within yourself. Yeah. So actually say to yourself, okay, I'm feeling nervous. It's really okay to feel that way. You know, I don't need to push that away. I don't need to kind of run away because of that. Um, but, you know, allow them space to be there because sometimes if we can get a healthy relationship with the, um, with the fear, with the nerves, with the anticipation, um, you might find that when you go to that work on a Wednesday, you're more at peace even if you go in with those feelings, right? So it's not always about changing negative feelings into positive feelings. Sometimes it's about being able to turn up even though you feel those things. And you may be surprised, you know, you walk into that situation, you can even mention it to the people there. Why not? Maybe that's not very British. I don't know if you're in Britain or not, but why not say, I really want to help you. I am feeling nervous, you know, please forgive me if I seem a bit on edge. I want to do my best and, you know, and and then you you elicit their support as well right because everybody's struggling you're struggling they're struggling why can't we draw on each other for a little bit of support and then they'll really appreciate that you're there and they also might express that you know they might take that bit of extra care about you and say you know this Wednesday we understand it's been hard don't come in this Wednesday that's fine you know so I think give yourself permission to go in feeling the way you do also give yourself permission to withdraw if that becomes too much, you know, because sometimes we do push ourselves too hard and it doesn't have a very beneficial effect on ourselves and our own um, well-being in the longer run. So see if you can balance it a little bit, be honest and do your best without pressure. I hope that helps. Of course, if you decide not to go, that's also fine.
you can just be very honest about why, you know, you can say that you were really hoping to help and you really want them to succeed and they can find someone else. They will find someone else. You know, it's not all your responsibility. Okay, wow, a lot of questions coming in here. We still have time, good. I've been practicing meditating on equanimity, holding an unpleasant experience at the same time as a pleasurable one in the body. I notice that the unpleasant sensations are much stronger than the pleasant ones. And so it's hard to feel balanced. Do you have any tips for finding greater balance? Thank you. Yeah, I think the balance is not so much here between the unpleasant and the pleasant. It's more a balance in the sense that we're able to hold each equally with steadiness, to be steady with both. So it might be that you're trying to hold that unpleasant experience too tightly in the sense that you're very close to it. And I think sometimes being with a pleasurable one at the same time can help balance that if we know when to turn more towards the pleasant one. So it might be that you want to be closer to the pleasant one and further away. Does this make any sense? Like further away mentally from the unpleasant one. So for example, there's a pain in the knee or there's maybe an emotion in the body. And part of the mind is with that, but maybe only a small part of the mind. And the main part of the mind is with the parts in the body that are not in pain or with the, um, with the side of the mind that is actually quite peaceful, right? Because I've noticed for myself, I can have like some sadness, but at the same time, there's quite a lot of peace in the mind if I care to look. So sometimes I gravitate more towards the, the pleasant, if I feel that I'm not resourced enough to be too long with the unpleasant or too close to the unpleasant. Other times I find that my mind is resourced, it's resilient, and I can stay with the unpleasant for longer. So it's really, in that sense, you could call it a balancing act, but real equanimity is being completely at ease with both. And for me, the best way that I've learned to practice equanimity is simply by not even labeling experiences as pleasant or unpleasant, but by simply contacting the physical sensation and noticing that it's of the nature to arise and pass away. Because when you can actually contact the arising and passing, which is in a sense, going through the sensation, yeah? So for example, there might be um, tightness, tension, throbbing, but inside that you can feel that there's a vibration there, that there's like maybe heat there, that there's energy there. It starts to dissolve and feel much less solid. And at that time, the pain can actually shift so that you don't any longer label it pain or unpleasantness. It actually just feels quite interesting. And the main quality that you're observing is the arising and passing away. So for me, this is much more helpful actually than working with say, what I would label pleasant and unpleasant. And those labels start to kind of melt away. So I'm more in touch with the actual underlying nature of the experience than the, uh, whether it's pleasant or not. So I don't know if that helps, but that uh, certainly has helped with me. Um, as part of that practice, I also give equal attention to each part of the body so that I don't get stuck in anything that particularly pulls the mind because the mind does have negativity bias. It will always be drawn to what's more complicated, what's more difficult, or perhaps something that we identify the sense of self with. You know, say um, you, you're fine with certain emotions, but you're not fine with other emotions. Say you have an idea that you're a depressed person and depression comes up, that will be much, much harder to deal with than another emotion that you don't identify with so much. It's like, oh no, depression again. And I remember I was depressed before and this means I'll always be depressed. And after all, I have a history of depression. And that will be harder simply because you identify so much with it. So it's not necessarily that that's more unpleasant, but there's a greater sense of self-connected. So when we can start to just see it as a phenomena and we can learn that this is an aspect of nature that arises and passes, that already brings a lot of balance about. And we don't need to you know, shift to a more pleasant experience, yeah? So see how you feel at any one time. And if you are struggling, you know, just give more attention to whatever's easy in the body or mind. 
just last thing, and I hope it's not too much different technical sort of ideas, but uh, one of the things I find really helpful if there's a lot of uh, emotional difficulty or feelings of whatever, sadness, loneliness, or maybe discomfort in the body, because it always you know, is reflected in the body, is to go to the extremities, to go to kind of feel the skin of the body. Yeah, or the palms of the hands or the soles of the feet, any part of the body which is quite pleasant, quite easy to stay with. And you're still in contact with the reality. You'll still feel the other things, but your awareness is bigger, it's wider, and it's staying with something that's easy to be with. So I find this also very helpful. So I hope there's something there that is of use. <laughs> Uh, okay, there's a lot of questions here. So I might not be able to answer everybody. Uh, let's see, I don't want to miss any either. Uh, okay. Okay, so someone's saying that evenings are harder in the sense of um, finding a shape for them, they feel lonelier and it's harder to stop to meditate. I think that's really true, yeah. It's easier to start in the morning with the practice. We wake up and we feel a bit groggy anyway, so it's really nice to have a morning routine. And it is harder to stop in the day, any time in the day, to meditate because we're on a kind of, we have a certain momentum, you know, our conditioning is just going full force, especially if you've had a working day, a busy working day, you're kind of quite speedy. So I would say take small steps towards quietening the mind in the evenings. It is harder to stop and meditate, but that also means that if you do stop to meditate, you're developing greater strength. You know, you're going more against the stream. So it takes more resolve, which can be very helpful. Um, so it depends on you. You could tell yourself that every day I will commit to this half hour or this 20 minutes, whatever it is. But another thing you could do is to try to just insert little moments of mindfulness throughout the day so that it's not that in the morning you do your meditation and that's the end of it, but that you remember from time to time during the day to stop even for five minutes. As Ajahn Brahm and I were saying in the break, we were saying, you know, even just go to the toilet, you know, and stay in there a little bit longer than you need to physically because your mind is congested, your mind is constipated. So sit there and close your eyes, you know? Sometimes just closing our eyes gives our body and mind a signal to just slow down and relax. Mm -hmm. I know that as a highly sensitive person, this is a thing that I'm learning more and more about, but this is, uh, I'm right up there on the top scale of the scale. <laughs> and uh, basically we take in, and many people here, I'm sure similar to me, take in a lot of information. You're very, very receptive. And you, know, you just take in a lot of data throughout the day, emotions from others as well. And even just closing your eyes for a few minutes can be very restorative. So I would say do this when you can. Another thing you might want to try, if it's hard to immediately stop and meditate, is some stretching, of course. Stretching can be good. Or maybe you can play like a, um, I found something online, actually. It's really nice. I don't suppose I can give you the link now, but it's a, a, it's a, a Qigong practice. And it's really slow and gentle with a Chinese lady. Um, it's not one where they're giving any instruction. She just, she's sitting out, she's standing outside in this beautiful um, environment near the water with lovely trees. I think it's the springtime and there's bird song. And she's just standing there going through the movements and it's completely silent. Like the instructions are just written there on the screen and it's 20 minutes. So everyone can find 20 minutes, I hope. And it's movement and meditation together. So this is great. I think it's called something like Eight Pieces of Brocade, something like that. And it's by Judy somebody. And she's a lovely, um, they call Shifu actually, like we could call, call her an elder, a venerable, a master of Qigong. Judy somebody. I forget her second name, but she's very lovely. This might be nice. And the other thing is walking meditation, yeah? Because often we think meditation means we have to sit on our bum. So we go from being busy and running around to stop and meditate. You sit down and the mind is just, you know, everywhere. 
So if you can, if you can find a place in your home or just outside your home, maybe you can have a short path and you can just like slow down your steps and feel your feet, ideally with your shoes off. I love to do that even in this temperature, <laughs> but don't get a chill. My feet never get cold. So, so even in this temperature, I can walk on the grass for a short period of time and just feel those sensations and get embodied again. So this is also very, very helpful, yeah? Okay, so I hope some of those things work or help. Uh, yeah, because of the loneliness, I would say it might be good to have a little schedule there, like have a little 20 minutes or half hour, however long you want. Yeah, maybe to have that company in terms of the guidance will help you feel a little bit less lonely. Guided meditation, guided Qigong. So someone's asking, how can I sustain jhana practice in daily life? So it depends what you mean by jhana practice. I tend not to call it jhana practice because for me, jhana is the goal. The practice is actually kindfulness. <laughs> Interestingly, someone has put that in a box right under the question. <laughs> I don't think it's meant to be related, but uh, I think it's more around sustaining the causes, right? To me, that's what jhana practice is about. It's about putting the causes in place. The jhanas are just the result of right attitude and right intention, right causes for those things to arise. So again, it's really about, you know, cutting out that time of your life, taking out the time in your life to have a regular practice, you know, to sit there, to develop the right attitude. I'm going to just give this time for my meditation. I'm not looking for any result. I'm not looking to get peaceful. I'm not looking to experience jhana or nimittas or anything special. I'm just here to be with myself and to make peace with myself. You know, this is time for me. So not having any expectation of your practice, just taking it as an opportunity to let go of the burdens of your day, right? And let go is also sometimes a difficult word because we think, oh, there's the burden, I have to let go. That means I have to do something, I have to drop it. But again, the first step in that is letting it be, right? So you're not actually trying to push it away. You're just trying to be with these things. And that is really what letting go is about. The first step of letting go is letting be, okay? So you stay with that. You just open up to it. You treat it with kindness. Oh, poor mind, I've really pushed you today you know there's been so much thinking now the mind's kind of still reverberating never mind sit there you know just let it be for as long as it needs to be there and give yourself time to settle down since my mains retreat I've been really busy you know coming back to meeting all the different groups in my project and having meetings and that hasn't even started in full <laughs> and lots of emails lovely emails you know teaching organizing this day and uh, yeah, at first, when I was meditating after my rains, my mind would just get very quiet because it was almost like it missed the peace. So it would just leap for the silence. But now a few days in, there's more kind of, what do you call it? Not necessarily even lots of thinking, but just lots of uh, movement in the mind and definitely more thinking. And it can take, you know, a good, half hour 45 minutes for that to settle down so what I do with my practice is just really come into the body come into the body make peace don't have any agenda whatsoever and you know towards the end of that sit because I, I give myself a longer time the mind starts to really become peaceful and that kind of peace is more powerful than the kind that we sort of put as a very thin sort of layer on top so definitely no pushing in daily life and try to find joy, try to find joy in everything you do, because the whole process of samadhi is one of happiness. And so it's important to notice the peace, to notice the joy, to notice uh, even the joy of virtue, right? Keep your virtue really strong and reflect on the beautiful things that you've done in the day, the ways that you've given of your time, the ways that you've even taken a break and given some compassion to yourself, you know, the beautiful nature. Keep those lovely perceptions in your mind so that when you sit down, you can tune into that. Yeah. And really uh, set your mind off on the right track. So there's a few um, tips. And 
you know, if it's really leading towards jhana, if you have a very deep practice, then those things will come about when the conditions allow. So don't worry at all about it. And make sure you take time every year, if you can, for some retreat time, you know, where there really is nothing to do, nothing to organize. Everybody else has organized the retreat and all you have to do is show up on your cushion, show up on your seat. Oh, hello, somebody from Turkey. That's nice to see you here. Okay, there's lots more questions. And I'm going to just take a sip of tea. So please also take a breather. I also want to give you some time to talk together. Would that be a nice thing to do? What do you feel? Yeah, it'd be quite nice. So I might only ask one more question. I think somebody would like to ask a question uh, directly. Is that right, Tint? Would you like to? You're welcome to, but you will be recorded. Is that okay for you? Cool. So I'll unmute you and, and give you the chance. Good afternoon, Van River. Thank you for being here. Um, I just want to ask a very short one. Um, in Burmese, uh, we go, we are with our Google, but I don't know exactly how to translate in English and to explain to my uh, non-Buddhist husband, who is a very good Christian, but I like to get the advice from you. How can I um, put, the, uh, how can I explain to that sort of uh, very good Christian people about the we are with our Google? Thank you, Van Rivel. Okay, well, now you're challenging my memory of Burmese very much. Kudo is like doing good, isn't it? Like kusala. Is that right? Yes. And vea visa is like with wisdom? I forget. And vea visa is a sort of like, for example, I come to your monastery and do the, you know, sweeping the floor or, or doing the washing yeah. in the kitchen for all the monastic right 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 sort of yeah 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 it's like making good karma making merit by doing services to the monastics and specifically to the monastics or yes i think so yes. to support people who are practicing isn't it mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean i would personally say that if a person's not buddhist then this can also apply to supporting anyone who's doing good, even if it's not practicing in a Buddhist monastery. I mean, for example, there are people who are doing good by, um, you know, raising funds for a charity or by, you know, looking after the homeless or yeah. um, by supporting refugees or supporting, you know, marginalized communities. So this is also um helping people who are trying to do their best in life and I would say this also counts as making merit right helping these people who are uh, maybe struggling or maybe helping support some of those communities take a job in a charity you know or um, support other people who are trying to do good you've been on uh, on Facebook quite a bit and I know you follow the um, Insight Myanmar uh, mm. page and they're doing incredible things to support um, the people who are really suffering right now under what you can all really only call a fascist regime right and there are ways to support these kind of things as well that maybe are more easy to understand for non-Buddhists you know because it's about really it's about life and death so if a person doesn't have the inclination to go to a monastery, it doesn't mean that they can't still make good karma and do beautiful deeds to support others who really need it. Okay. Um, if you are trying to encourage them to go to a monastery and they're not a Buddhist, it's interesting, I had this conversation recently. Um, I think it's important to focus on what they can actually practically do and to avoid them being put off by any sort of perceived formalities and rituals because for some people that really puts them off going to a monastery they think what am I going to do how should I pay respect I might get it wrong I might not offer it in the right way so try to focus on what it is they're actually doing you know you're cooking food it doesn't matter if you don't offer it in exactly the right way um, you know and just get them to delight in in uh, the generosity of that deed even before it's completed yeah okay. so the buddha talked about these uh reflecting on goodness on virtue and he said to reflect before you do the generous act 
during the generous act and after the generous act as well. So it's really important to feel joy in these things, not to feel fear, not to feel like, oh, but it's not my religion or I might get it wrong or anything like this, but just to, you know, from your heart, understand what you're doing and why. Yeah, because it's different for different people. Not everybody feels, you know, that that the same way as, as traditional Buddhist people, especially the Burmese people, you know, Myanmar people, you have this innate understanding of the purpose of serving monastics because you know that we're practicing full time, right? For the sake of liberation. But there are other people too who are doing good things in this world. So you can still make good karma that way. I hope Thank that you. helps. Is there anything, anything more you'd like to add to that or? Ask. Um, no, I think it's very precise and clear. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank Thanks you. for the question. <laughs> yeah, on that topic, just the other day, actually, um, I went with a friend to one of the monasteries in England. And um, sometimes I feel like, oh, I'm not sure I should go to the monasteries. I'm a bikini. They don't really support bikinis. But, you know, I always believe that these uh, individual monks are not systems, right? Whatever that kind of um, system has decided as a decision, you know, and sort of their formal stance is not necessarily representing individuals involved in that. And so, um, yeah, with the help of a lay friend, uh, she cooked some dana and we went down and offered the meal to the monks and they spent a long time talking to me and there was absolute friendliness between us there was absolutely no question of you know being excluded or you know anything controversial coming up one of those monks anyway is a good friend of Ajahn Brahm and he mentioned Ajahn Brahm and that he'd stayed in his monastery many years ago for two years and uh and he, his kindness just touched him so much. And while he was saying this, he, he said, I've got a lump in my throat and tears are coming to my eyes. He said, he said, oh, silly me kind of thing. I said, no, no, it's great. I'm going to tell Ajahn because I know Ajahn also gets inspired. So we had this lovely connection, you know, we didn't have to go into the whole history or any of that. It was like we could share what it's like living in a monastery, running a monastery, doing the admin, you know, uh, finding a good location, all of those kind of things. And uh, the abbot of that monastery, it was the Honiton Monastery. Give it a plug. <laughs> um, he spent like two hours before lunch just available just chatting you know showing us the shrine room telling us how it was built and how the buddha statue the buddha rupa was was made you know all the complicated uh, ways they have to make these things in thailand with the anyway very complicated technical process and it was just incredibly nourishing for me so you know it is really nice to go to monasteries from time to time and also places that are very opening and accepting. So you might like to try that place, actually, if you are thinking to drag your husband along. <laughs> They're very friendly there. Yeah. And hopefully, of course, when we have our place, then you'll all come to us as well. <laughs> Great. So I do have to apologize for the questions that we can't get to, but we are hoping now to um, have some little groups and I would really like to encourage everyone not to disappear because the best part of the day is later. <laughs> it's the meta meditation and the blessings. And we also have a surprise for you, a very exciting event to announce at the end of the day. So please don't disappear. Um, so what's going to happen now is that you'll get an invitation to go into a little room with about three other people and you can just meet each other there. Sometimes it's nice if you just sit together in silence for 10 minutes, sorry, 10 seconds, because you only have about 10 minutes all together and just land. And then each person can just take time to share whatever's on your mind, whatever you feel, anything at all. And the other people listen with kindness, just hold the space. So it doesn't have to be very strict in terms of two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, but each person just has a chance to share whatever you want to share from the day, from your life, from, you know, maybe you even want to ask the others for some advice, whatever it might be. And I know that, you know, many members of the community are here today, so you've done this before and you might be brave enough to give it a go. If you really feel you don't want to give this a go, it's fine. You just don't accept the invitation, okay? And you'll stay in the main room. And in 10 minutes, everyone else will rejoin the main room again. 
But in all this time that I've been teaching online the last two years, I've never met anyone who regretted giving this a go. They find it very nourishing to be around other Dhamma practitioners, you know, and to have that space to just hear, listen and share. You don't have to have anything particular to say. You can just go in and offer your company, offer your ear to someone else if you wish. So you'll get a little invitation. I think the co-host will get one too. You don't have to accept it. Uh, but if you wish, please do give it a go. And I'll see you back here in 10 minutes. I will now. So we're going to end this day with our meta practice together and just sharing um, some of our own happiness and joy. And if you don't have a lot right within yourself right now, you could develop a little bit and also receive a little bit from this group because it's always available if we only tune up to it. So it's not all down to you. So take this very easy, very lightly, and let's see if we can actually just relax and perhaps practice receiving and just sharing amongst ourselves, first of all. Keep it simple. So we'll do a bit of guided meditation, then I'll chant a blessing. And after that, we'll end with a little talk, Dana talk with some uh, information about the upcoming events and we can wave goodbye at the end. So, taking in any of the nourishment that you felt from the day, the inspiration perhaps that you've experienced through hearing the Dhamma, through being with spiritual friends, and perhaps through sharing just now in your groups for those who felt that that was appropriate to try out today. There'll always be another chance, <laughs> but it's really good to see that all of you chose what it was that you felt you most need. So yeah, just closing our eyes. And sustaining that sense of both being connected, being within a field of spiritual friendship, an energetic field of holding, of care, whilst also being embodied, being grounded, physically present, to your own inner world. Feeling whatever sensations most stand out to you right now. And even though this is only a short meditation, please don't skip this step of just making any adjustment that you need to, if perhaps the weight is unevenly distributed in your ankles or your, on your knees. Or if you place your hands in a strange position, just see if you can give them a little bit more space, a bit more ease. Part of the posture that is also important is your lips. So see what it feels like to just give yourself, put a little smile on those lips. As though you're smiling at your inner world. You're welcoming yourself into the moment just as you are. Granting yourself a moment of peace. What a beautiful, generous offering this is. 
an act of true self-care. And if it feels comfortable for you, you may wish to sense the area around the heart, the chest, or any other part of the body that feels fairly at ease, fairly pleasant and relaxed. Just letting the mind gently hover Gently rest. And wishing yourself well, mentally. Offering yourself words, blessings, good wishes of loving kindness. that are tailor-made just for you. One of the phrases I used during my own retreat was, may I love and accept myself just as I am. May I be truly content. So see what resonates for you right now. And shower yourself with these blessings, these loving words of metta and goodwill. And if it helps for you at this moment, you might wish to imagine yourself receiving loving kindness as though the Buddha were right here with us now. gazing upon you with kindly eyes, full of sympathy, understanding, and tender concern.
allowing yourself to just relax in this presence of loving kindness. It's available in the universe. And staying connected to your own body, heart, any sensation that feels fairly pleasant and relaxed. Imagine all of us here together on the Zoom, dotted throughout the world, also sharing this field of loving kindness. generated from within and without you, all around you, through you, through the Buddha, through the great enlightened monks and nuns. Imagine all of us here receiving, sharing, basking in this loving kindness, softening any pain, fear, bereavement, or distress. At this moment, we're connected. We're not alone. We belong. May we all love and accept ourselves just as we are. May we be truly content. May we be free from all suffering. May we be fully liberated. And imagine that all of us are glowing with the golden light of loving kindness. All of us dotted around the globe. And that loving kindness spreads from each one of us to cover the entire world. spreading kindness and care to all beings everywhere. May all beings be safe, free from danger and harm. May all beings dwell with hearts of loving kindness towards each other and towards themselves. To 
May all beings be free from hunger, thirst, disease, oppression, and fear. May they all receive this loving kindness. and experience deep and lasting peace. Imagining this whole world, planet Earth and beyond, glowing with this golden light of loving kindness. And you are just one among so many countless beings, human, non-human, visible or invisible, far or near. Just allowing yourself to receive to partake of this beautiful shared loving kindness and resting for a while. So just see if you can imagine yourself receiving the shared loving kindness without any effort at all. As I chant the blessing. Sabe sata. Sabe pana. Sabe Buddha, Sabe Pugala, Sabe Atta Bawa Pariyapana, Sabe Tio. Sabe Purisa Sabe Ariya Sabe Anaria Sabe Deva Sabe Manusa Sabe wini padika awe wa hontu abya paja hontu ani ga hontu sukiyatana parihala. Duk kam hunjantu Yadalada sampatito Mawe gachantu Kamasaka Sa Sadu. Sadu. <laughs> oh.
I'm so glad it's not only me who does that. On the live stream, you think it's just me, but all these people on the screen are doing the three big sadhus and it looks very lovely. And it's a nice stretch at the end of the day. <laughs> lovely to see your joyful faces. And uh, yeah, the time went so quickly, but I hope that um, you managed to receive a little bit of metta and leave this beautiful meeting a little bit more peaceful and joyful and perhaps accepting of yourself than when you came so whatever you're going through you know it will pass and um, please don't try to push it away i did get a, a message from someone a question from someone who recently lost their father and i wanted to mention that because um, i'm really sorry that i didn't have time to to answer you properly on that but I would just like to really encourage you to stay with how you feel and to accept the grieving process because this is obviously a huge life change and it seems that you were very close to your father and now you're saying you know you don't know if you can carry on but you know this is part of a massive process it's almost like life transforming you'll be morphing into a new person and sometimes when we go through great suffering and grief we come out the other side with more compassion and understanding for others and you'll be able to help other people in a similar situation to you so don't try and push the process too quickly or push away the grief it's very natural you'll be feeling all kinds of other emotions too and you know always reach out if you need to even though we couldn't give a lot of time today to individual questions you know we have this beautiful community and someone here has just said that's how it was for me when I lost my mother so this is a human experience, a common experience. And, you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. Even if you've been practicing for 20 years, 30 years, you know, this is a natural process that we go through. And I think sometimes we feel we shouldn't suffer or it's wrong to suffer. And yet, actually, this is very much a part of life. The first noble truth, you know, of the Buddha, there is suffering, but there is a way out. So, you know, this is part of that way out meeting the suffering first of all and coming here together as spiritual friends thank you so much for the lovely comments coming in it's incredibly encouraging and thank you to stephanie who put in the link to the qigong i mentioned that is the correct one with judy somebody i forget uh yeah so that's the one uh i don't know if you can scroll up and save the chat or something but uh it might help some of you and yes, I would very soon like to close, but I'd like to invite Derek first to say a few words. He can also mention the event that we have coming up and a way to put questions in another session. So thank you to all the hosts, the co-hosts, the people, the participants, the people who ask questions. Thank you to all of you. You're absolutely fantastic. And I wouldn't be doing this uh, if it wasn't for you. You know, I'm doing this for you even though I didn't know who would come on board, but I'm so glad that it's you guys. <laughs> it makes me very happy. Good. And thank you so much to you too, Venerable Chanda, and also to Ajahn Brahm for your presence, your guidance, your teachings, and meditation guidance. Thank you very much for being there. <laughs> and thank you all for being there today. Thank you everyone for being there because this end of retreat celebration would not be the same without everybody present and I know from the amount of people we have on live streaming watching and also the amount of people that registered for the event today that there's a huge amount of support for the Anacapa project and it's it's amazing thank you all and if you would like to support well Ajahn Brahm has, has told you all about <laughs> why to support for the <laughs> for the Anacapa project and he has given a much better description of it all than I could. But if you'd like to know how, then I'm going to put now in the chat box the links. Please visit, for more information, anucamperproject.org forward slash donate. And if you have any questions about this or anything else to do with the Anucamper Project, you can contact us at team at anucamperproject.org. Okay, so now for the special events that we wanted to announce, and that is that it's very exciting. We're going to have two wonderful female teachers and monastics joining us together at the same time. So Venerable Chanda and Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo are going to be together on the 27th of November at 1.30 p.m. UK time for a question and answer session. And the only thing is that uh, Jetsuma has asked for the questions to be 
given to her in advance. So we'd like you, if you could, please to send your questions to pa at anukampaproject.org. And Jetsum is a wonderful, probably the most senior Western teacher alive today. She's been um, living as a monastic since 1967. And there's a lot of experience there as much as Sajjan Brahm. So two wonderful teachers together at the same time. It's a great opportunity. So we'd love to see you there then. And more information will be found in the upcoming newsletter or annualcamperproject.org forward slash events. Thank you all very much and I hope to see you again soon. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Derek. It's always so joyful to hear your joy in the way that you uh, you thank us all and, you know, obviously benefit from this and, and you, the joy of service that you give. It's wonderful. And thank you to everybody who's serving. Um, so, yes, this event will really be Jetsumma Tenzin Palmo more than myself. Um, I'm simply there, you know, but I'll be also just receiving her wisdom because she's been in robes, like you said, for even longer than Ajahn Brahm. And she's the very first, I think, Western bhikkhuni to be ordained in the Tibetan tradition and maybe, you know, across all the traditions, I think. I'm not quite sure, but um, obviously she's been in robes a very long time. For those of you who don't know her, you may know the book, The Cave in the Snow. Um, she is the English, the British nun who actually went to live in a cave, a real cave, 3,100 meters or so above sea level in the Himalaya for 12 years. I don't think she even lay down for those 12 years. She's sort of slept upright in a box and had sort of, you know, several meditation sessions a day of two to three hours and um, obviously gained some deep practice and wisdom through that time. So it, it is a different tradition. She'll be talking about her understanding of the Dhamma as she um, frames it and experiences and describes it through the Tibetan tradition. So there may be some similarities and some differences, but I think it's really helpful sometimes to uh, hear the Dhamma expressed in beautiful, diverse ways. So it's going to be a very exciting event. It's on the 27th of November, um, as Derek said. I'm just repeating you, aren't I? <laughs> but uh, I definitely encourage you to come along. Um, you can sign up to our newsletter on our website and you will get the information that way as well. And, uh, and we hope to see you there. I'll also be starting my regular events pretty soon. That will also be announced in the newsletter. And uh, there'll be, I'm going to call them irregular events. So it'll be the regular events page on the website, but called irregular events because uh, there are lots of other things coming up in between, like the retreat with Ajahn Brahm. So myself, well, Ajahn Brahm really, assisted by me, will be teaching a retreat from the 6th to the 12th of November. It's a home-based Zoom retreat. And we did the same thing last year. And, you know, if any of you have come to the, to the public talks and you think, yeah, you know, the talks are nice, whatever, it's very different on retreat. There's a real energy that develops amongst the group. There's a real sense of holding and we have a chance to dig much, much deeper into the depth of Ajahn Brahm's practice and understanding of the Dhamma. So I do hope you'll come to that. There's still about 10 places left on the retreat. So you can find that also on the events page. Okay. And thank you again to everybody who's been here. Yeah, it's just wonderful to feel that this project benefits so many and that you all came today, so thank you so much. And I think we can probably stop recording. I also just wanna thank the people on Facebook because I don't know who you are. I haven't been on the Facebook page as this has been streaming, but I know that we have a lot of supporters and you're equally valuable. I also know that many of you may have applied to be here today and perhaps just missed getting into the Zoom session, but you're very much in the sphere of Meta and your support is important, so please come again. If you didn't get in today, it's because you need to come a little bit earlier, so try that next time, and we'll see you somewhere soon, okay? So take care, everyone, and we'll wave goodbye. We can unmute everybody, actually, and allow you to uh, say goodbye yourself. So we should stop the recording.